you like the 2010s, the age of punk rock and bad hairstyles? No? Well, too bad, because today we're looking at something a little controversial, a little bit hated on. Today we're looking at DMC Devil May Cry, a famously hated game, especially by the DMC fanbase, and has widely been regarded as the black sheep, with some people saying it's even worse than DMC2. Play DMC2 is the best! Probably one of the worst games ever made. But why is this? What caused such backlash to this game? Was it warranted? And most importantly, how well does the game stand on its own two feet in comparison to the DMC series and stylish action games as a whole? Well, let's get into it. Before we can even start about that, I need you to brutally ambush that subscribe button in its home. So that then, we can talk about the pre-release running up to the game's launch. Before we even mention DMC Devil May Cry, we have to talk about the previous entry in the franchise, DMC4. DMC4 was released in 2008 and was known to be a rush game and many fans felt it didn't compare to the previous DMC3 in quality, which to this day fights DMC5 for the top spot in the franchise. That and the open-ended ending, what? That and the open-ended ending to the game left many fans in dismay as they felt that the game could have been better and were left wanting more DMC. This is where the problem began, as after DMC4, it was radio silence from Capcom. They then had to wait two years until the Tokyo Game Show in 2010, where the very first trailer of DMC Devil May Cry dropped. My name is Dante. They hated it. Why might you ask? Well, it's because this game was made by Ninja Fury instead of Capcom, as this was the time when Capcom insisted they should outsource their work to the West. This resulted in DMC Devil May Cry being a remake instead of a mainline entry, as well as being a drastic departure from what people were used to tonally, as well as a redesign of fan favorite characters such as Dante into this, as Capcom told Ninja Fury to try and make the game more Western inspired. People said that the new Dante design was a step down from the original, as well as seeing this different, more serious tone as a bad thing, as the original DMC games were known for their lighthearted and goofy nature, which really added to the charm of the games. Not only this, but the new Dante was a smoker and seemed to be underweight, which resulted in a lot of hate being thrown towards the remake before it even came out. This backlash to the original trailer resulted in the redesign of the Dante, bulking him up a bit, as well as dropping his smoking habit. In addition to this, they made the game seem far less dark than it was in the original trailer, but it was too late. People had made their judgments and already labeled DMC Devil May Cry as a stupid idea and were upset they weren't getting a mainline entry. Thinking that now, since this reboot was coming out, that was it for the original DMC series. Later, this would be disproven as we'd get DMC5, but without the hindsight we have now, it seemed like a truly desperate time to be a DMC fan, as you would no longer have the wacky woohoo pizza man, but instead, teen angst and punk rock. I'm your prime date, you ugly sack of shit. Just imagine I gave you this delicious ice cream cone, and for years, I would just keep giving you more and more of this ice cream the exact way you love it, okay? Each time, I had something special, you know, just to make it a bit better every time. But then one day, instead of handing you your beloved ice cream that you've come to love and cherish, I throw it on the ground and I stomp on it. And instead of handing you ice cream, I pull out a gun. Now I know, I know, that's a bit extreme. But you see the point I'm making. People didn't expect this kind of thing from DMC. So even if you enjoyed the themes that DMC Devil May Cry presented, you may have not liked the game purely because you are so used to the main series. This would have had a huge impact on the game's reception. The game came out January 15th, 2013, and it was critically well received. Both the graphics and gameplay being praised, but Lo and behold, the fans did not receive it well. They were left with a grim, gritty story with some questionable dialogue. The world is at last your bitch, as am I. Nothing left but to grab it by the hair, bend it over. And but how was the game, actually? If you take away these factors and look at it, as a simple piece of media, completely detached from the DMC franchise. Imagine that DMC Devil May Cry is its own thing completely. Well, how does it stand up? You see, DMC Devil May Cry has actually enjoyable gameplay. Sue me. Dante feels responsive, as well as having a wide variety of moves and weapons to use. Plus, the additions of the Angel and Demon paws is excellent and helps keep gameplay flowing for the same reason I love Virgil and DMC5. You can instantly reach enemies anywhere. Plus, unlike DMC5 Virgil, 
you can choose if they come to you or if you move to them. Adding an extra layer of thought to movement in combat. Do I pull that enemy into this crowd to maximize damage? Or go over there so there's no risk of me being hit, but I'm only hitting one enemy. It's on the fly decision making like that which makes DMC games so fun. Plus, the angel dash ability, which is meant to replace Dante's trickster dash, is very fun to use as you carry momentum, allowing for some very slick moves. Naturally, Dante has his iconic Rebellion, as well as Ebony and Ivory, the same iconic moves which can be unlocked by collecting white orbs for experience. But he has Devil Weapons and Angel Weapons in this game. Devil Weapons are slow but high damaging, and Angel Weapons are fast but low damaging. Naturally, Devil Weapons are more fun. I found myself gravitating towards Arbiter, which is the Axe, and Eryx, the Stone Fists, far more than the Osiris Siphon Aquila Shurikens. God, those names are awkward to say. All of these you gain as you progress through your first playthrough in typical DMC style. I'd say that in terms of variety though, it's a bit lacking. There isn't an exceptionally weird weapon like the guitar weapon or motorbike. However, these five weapons combined with the wide variety of guns allow you to do some pretty cool stuff and with a relatively lower amount of game knowledge needed. Unlike in DMC3, a game that to this day, I can't get a feel for those sweet, sweet triple S combos. <laughs> But it has to be said, there are some strange inputs to this arsenal of equipment because of one huge gaping flaw in this game's gameplay. There is no lock-on system. That's right kids, no lock-on system. Not only does this make targeting a specific enemy harder than it was in the past, but it completely changes the inputs of a large number of moves like Stinger. Stinger is probably the most spammable move in DMC because the input is just forward attack when locked on. Now, in DMC Devil May Cry, it's forward forward attack, which may not sound bad, but I think I hit this move about three times the whole campaign, due to just how inconvenient that input is, and the fact other moves do the same thing easier. Now this issue was fixed in the, in the Definitive Edition that came to consoles, but since I'm on PC, Capcom, in their infinite wisdom, said, Yeah, you see that guy? Fuck him. And refused to release the Definitive Edition on PC at all, which not only added a lock-on system, provide some very much needed quality of life improvements. For instance, there are coloured enemies which you need to use the respective weapon to do any damage to. Blue for angel weapons, red for demon weapons. And if you use the wrong weapon, you bounce off stopping all combos and movement. But in the definitive edition, you simply do no hit stun to the enemy and do way less damage than you would with the correct weapon. There are mods on PC that will give you the definitive edition add-ons. But I am too spiteful to make the game more fun for myself, so I played without these patches because I refuse to let Capcom off the hook. And you know what, just because of that, they're on the list. What do you mean I'm nitpick? The boss fights. The boss fights range from pretty awesome to why? Just, just, just why? I guess that's kind of the trend this game goes for overall, but we can talk about that later. DMC's bosses are hindered by the demon pull and angel pull mechanics of the game. Now why is this? I thought you liked those mechanics. Well, throughout the game, there will be these parkour sections which require you to use both of these tools in order to progress, either by pulling obstacles out of your way or simply moving through the air. Which, yeah, that's fine by itself. When you add this element to boss fights, however, that's where the fun meter goes drastically down. I'd say the bosses that suffer the most from this are Mundus and the Succubus boss fight, because it turns them into gimmick fights. An infamously boring way to design a boss fight, especially in games like DMC. Their boss fights are primarily just hitting boss and to remove platform and then rinse and repeat. It's all the same reason people hate Savior from DMC4. It just doesn't make engaging gameplay at all. I unironically prefer Dark Souls 2 Troll to any boss like this. Ironically enough, the first and final boss fights, I'd say, are the best by far, as they are the more classical boss designs in an arena where both of you are able to move around. But the one that lives in my head of Rent Free has to go to Bob the Republican Barbus, baby. I don't like him putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay! The whole boss fight is just him trash talking you whilst you're on the news, fighting normal enemies. Rampantly spreading sexual disease of the unfolding. It ain't that the best kind, Bob. Then being teleported over to him to beat up his giant floating head. It's honestly so cool and unique. Even if it isn't very hard, boss, the visuals alone make up for it. Incredibly creative. Plus, I gotta love Alex Jones. <laughs> now, speaking of creativity, I think that DMC Devil May Cry is a very good looking game, both graphically and stylistically. Now what do I mean by this? Well, considering the game was released in 2013, it doesn't seem to suffer from that era of grey, gritty, ugly games that were coming out around that time. You failed! 
Instead, DMC tends to use more whites, greens, blues, reds, and yellows, which helps avoid the boring aesthetic of the time. Instead, we get treated to these gorgeous areas with some very inspired level design. Since most of the game takes place in Limbo, which is something very similar to the Mirror World in Doctor Strange, or ugh. Stranger Things. The designers had the opportunity to create these twisted versions of the environment, which will in some levels change around you and try to stop you making progress, or create obstacles to block your path. And the level itself is actually an enemy. How? Well, same reason my boy Bob Vargas was, talking trash. The level will hurl slurs at you with these texts that pop up, usually whilst either creating hazards or spawning enemies. This text me was a huge selling point, because it felt so unique. I think it works perfectly with the game's unique aesthetic. And you know me, baby. I'm all about them aesthetics. Honestly, I find this game to be so uniquely gorgeous. Even things like using Devil Trigger will create unique visuals, like changing Dante's hair and jacket, as well as making everything else grey and white. Just, mmm, so good. It even looks good on boss fights. Maybe I just like the graphics because I'm biased. You know, growing up playing games that were like these Force Unleashed Red Faction with these clay looking people that were human, but kind of plastic like. I feel like it's something that doesn't age that badly. Although I won't lie, some characters did not get the same love. Look at this ghoul. I mean, I'm not sure if she's meant to look this freakish considering she's a demon, but uh, look at Mundus, he looks relatively normal. Then you get this Until Dawn Wendigo looking ass. <laughs> Honestly, just looking at her sets off my fight or flight. Not to mention the traumatizing boss fight she has. Jesus. <laughs> but how can we talk DMC without talking about the music? If you're anything like me, then this stuff hits and it does hard. I mean, I'm an early 2000s kid. Of course I'm gonna love the punk rock, the metal, the techno. I mean, Dante's main theme, Never Surrender. It's a certified jam. And the final boss theme, Empty, has been in my gym playlist way before I even played the game. And I feel like my music taste says a lot about me. But ignore that. Battle themes are all appropriate. And even now I can remember a good few of them. But there still isn't anything quite as iconic as Devil's Never Cry or Buried Delight. It's still a good soundtrack though. If you like these genres of music. If you don't, then it'll probably sound like tacky garbage to you. Especially because there's no slowed and reverb. Or sped up remixes? Truly unbearable. This soundtrack will have one or two standouts for you. Then you'll probably forget the rest of them in time. Unless you religiously listen to the whole thing daily. And if you do, power to you, my friend. Now, up until here, everything's been somewhat positive. With a few nitpicks here and there. But, but now, now that stops. It's time to trash on this game. This game's story and writing is... Genuinely so cringeworthy. I physically shivered a couple of times when hearing the god awful dialogue. Or just confusing scenes. First off, we have this. Nothing left but to grab it by the hair, bend it over, and. Which is so infamously bad. Capcom tried to remove it in the definitive edition. But I know what you did. I saw this. I listened to this. It's bad fan fiction level. Basics first. The game is about Mundus, the main demon on Earth. He has taken over Earth by controlling people using media and corporations. The typical controls the world from the shadows bad guy. Except he does it with evil demon magic. Ooh. Now, Dante was just being a radical 2000s dude, banging chicks in his trailer when Mundus sends demons to kill him, which leads him to run into Cat, a medium who introduces him to the Resistance, who is led by Virgil, his twin brother, that he was separated from at an early age. The whole game is about the Resistance trying to overthrow the system that Mundus has put in place, very fitting for the anti-establishment punk aesthetic the whole game has. Now why is the writing so bad you may ask? Well, first, the dialogue. El Dantes has a lot of cringeworthy one-liners. The most famous of which is the Succubus intro cutscene. With them your prime date, you ugly sack of shit! Which has been memed into oblivion over the years, as well as the general potty mouth nature of this new Dante. That's just, instead of being a silly goofy little guy, he's now the not your grandma's protagonist character that thinks that swearing is cool. That's not to say he doesn't have some good lines, some of his one-liners are pretty decent. I just seem to drag on forever. Church. Not good. Yeah, whatever. But get overshadowed by the Sonic OC lines. Certain events in the story are also purely there for shock value, and just simply do not fit the characters at all, or serve to completely butcher any good faith you could have towards them. If you've played this game, you know what scene I'm talking about with Virgil, but um, let's break it down for each character, shall we? So Dante, throughout the game, he displays that he's only working with the Order begrudgingly, and throughout the game, he shows no sign of progressing over to liking humans and the cause, only to then suddenly have a change of heart and 
Now he cares about humans and stopping Mundus. Some of the only forms of development he gets towards this is when he's talking to Cat in the car on the way to the Bob Barber's boss fight, baby. Oh yeah. And is a known sexual deviant. Where she tells him about how Virgil saved her from a demon foster father that attacked her as a child, as well as how she's able to get into Limbo despite just being a regular human, and then how she killed her foster father. The other thing which develops him is the character Phineas, the a demon who helps Dante and shows him that oh, not everything is as black and white as it seems. This is because he, despite being a demon, helps out Dante and helps him kill other demons. He's the one who helps him get to Barbus's tower after all, so that he can kill the big four-headed boy. Not only that, he teaches Dante more about his Nephilim, half demon, half angel hybrid, I forgot to mention that. You know, his mum's an angel, whatever, whatever, don't worry about it. It's not very important. The game doesn't care that much either. But basically, the angels and demons were constantly at war, and Nephilim are an extinct race due to this. Where am I going with? But basically, he just teaches Dante about his heritage as a Nephilim and the powers that he has, as Nephilim are stronger than demons and angels because they have their two powers combined. Anyway, all of this is meant to serve as the start of his growth, but there is no growth. Instead, he just does a 180 and now he cares. He doesn't slowly come around like a normal story. Instead, this whole section of the game is just to make him go from kind of an asshole to less of an asshole. So, yeah. Dante is pretty much just a huge asshole, an edgy asshole. In contrast to his long-haired, light-hearted of a heart, this Dante takes himself a lot more seriously and reacts to the world around him with a lot less reverence as he's a lot more jaded than the OG Dante, likely because of the new gritty tone and the younger age. If I had to sum up what I meant by this, instead of being charismatic and funny, Dante comes off more snarky and dislikable. Like instead of that cool uncle everyone loves, it's that annoying 16-year-old cousin in his edgy face. This comes across in his dialogue, like I said, as a lot of his one line come down to Call of Duty insults from Timmy who just learnt his first swear, leading to them being a lot cringier than our boy OG Dante. You don't look a day over 12,000. Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! And he certainly does get less annoying and has his genuine moments. But I mean, he still suffers from the strange writing decisions the rest of the cast do. Also, it feels like Dante is the only person who actually does things for the sake of the plot. Cat may help with the limbo stuff and Virgil may be the tech guy cliche, but I mean, Dante is the one killing the demons in control. He does all the missions. Overall, he contributes the most to the plot out of the main three. Despite the fact he's the new hire, he's doing everyone else's work. This isn't a minimum wage job, it's a secret society. Like, come on, Virgil. Pull your weight, you're meant to be just as strong. Cool idea might have been to make the game more revenge focused, like a western. Dante working by himself to fight Mundus's legions of demons so he can finally get to Mundus himself. With the help of Cat, who could, you know, use the voodoo magic stuff to help him out. It just feels like Dante's basically doing it all by himself anyway. So, you know, why not capitalize on that? I mean, Virgil certainly does not serve much of a point other than then to exist because he was in previous titles. You got that right. What about Cat? Oh, Cat, one of the three main characters and a completely nothing character at that. I mean, her design is great, but out of the three, she definitely has the least development. She's basically just a plot device to serve as the reason behind Dante's development, and ultimately his love interest in the end, which is a shame. She had a lot of potential. She could have been the new lady from DMC3. She fine as well. Please hit me up if you like her, please. But instead, winds up fairly bland, which is a true shame. She, like Dante, has some decent moments. The one I think of first is the scene where the Order's hideout gets raided, and Dante talks her through the process to surrender to the police so she doesn't get shot when they breach into the room. I mean, they do it anyway, but like, <laughs> at least they tried. Helps them both feel more real as you see how panicked she is and the delivery certainly helps that. She serves for a way of Dante and Virgil to enter and leave Limbo on command, as well as sort of the planner for the final heist of the game. But she is still sort of one note despite this, especially with her final line of the game literally just being a statement. I don't know, kind of dumb. Let me know what you cat lovers out there think, but uh, I, don't, I don't like her. And now, ladies and gentlemen, prepare for a long ass rant. Virgil in the main series is probably the most recognizable and iconic character, a true fan favorite, with all those funny haha -ha videos all over the internet. Plus probably one of the best theme songs I've ever heard, as well as being so captivating whenever he's on screen. He's probably one of the best rival characters in media, period. And then we get this, this thing. DMC Virgil is a crime of the character. He's portrayed as being kind of cowardly and weak. A drastic change from our boy, as we almost never see Virgil fight. And when we do, he gets oh his ass kicked God. and he gets kicked oh. hard. Most of the time he sticks to hanging back and even doing computer hacking generic stuff or getting Cat to do stuff for him. Plus, look at his hat, it's so oh, stupid. No. God. But honestly, Virgil's biggest failures narratively are two key points. First, we have the scene where Virgil's whole character becomes an underhanded, weasley, despicable, uncomfortable, 
cool dude. In the trade off for Cat, Virgil and Dante try to trade Mundus's girlfriend for Cat's life. But halfway through the trade, Virgil does the most irredeemable act possible. <laughs> Why would they do this? Virgil is meant to be this beacon of hope, leader of the order and hero trying to liberate humanity. Now I know she was a demon and I know she's evil, but come on, do I really need to explain this? No, I don't. After this, you can't look at his character the same. It feels so out of left field. I mean, he does mention he didn't want to trade off a cap because he saw it as a bad move strategically. So doing this, he gets the best of both worlds, but come on, this is one of the least heroic actions ever. Now, I'm gonna talk about the ending. So if you don't want spoilers, skip to this timestamp. Are they gone? Yeah, I didn't like those guys either. So the mission after you defeat Mundus, Virgil pulls the whole, now I can rule as evil king, plot twist. <laughs> Which once again comes out of nowhere and dear God, he's the twist final boss. I feel like Ninja Fury just didn't know what to do with Virgil at a certain point, because these two scenes just feel off, especially the ending. I feel like Ninja Fury just wanted to get the Virgil boss fight in there because of previous titles. When honestly, keeping Virgil as a good guy would have been far more satisfying. And instead, they should have tried to make the Mundus boss fight better as a conclusion. Maybe have a big form fight and then the final mission switching to a fight more similar to Virgil with high mobility, high intensity. I won't lie though, Virgil's boss fight is by far the most enjoyable part of this game, gameplay wise. And I find myself replaying it constantly. Virgil's character is a victim to what preceded him, as it likely heavily influenced Ninja Fury into making him what he is, instead of going their own way with him. Although Virgil's character does have some good points like the others, we do get to see him and Dante grow their brotherly the bond over the course of the 20 missions, something we never saw in the mainline series, Stronger. even if it Stronger. leads to lines like this. And I got a bigger dick. Truly groundbreaking stuff. I also like how the brothers design are polar opposites of each other. Dante having darker hair and a bad attitude, supposed to represent the demon half of his father, but deep down acting good like his angel side. And Virgil who has white hair is well spoken and on the surface seemingly good intentions for somewhat selfish desires. In a way, Phineas also foreshadows the turn of Virgil, I suppose, as he shows us that not all demons can be evil, so that must mean that not all angels can be good as well. And since Virgil's portrayed more angel-like, you see, you see where I'm going with this? I'm reaching hard here. <laughs> also, out of every Virgil fight in each game, Remake Virgil's is the weakest. I'm not saying it's bad, it's still the best part of the whole game, but due to the Remake's lower skill requirement, he lacks the quintessential Virgil kills you over and over and over again that every other Virgil fight has, like a oh, DMC3 Virgil's final fight. <laughs> I hear that choir when I wake up at night in a cold sweat. Overall, this Virgil just feels like a huge downgrade, and tacked on for the sake of him being a fan favorite. I feel like the DLC does help to develop him a bit more, but overall, not great. How could this ever hold up to this though? This entire mission no is just Kino, so I mean a uh, skill issue ninja fairy. Finally, Mundus and Lilith. I just remembered her name. Let's go. They are the main villains of the game, and sadly, they are fairly standard. Nothing outstanding about either of them, other than that god-awful dialogue. Mundus is the generic tough guy and Lilith being this gross looking evil thing. I don't know man. They're both generic as it gets. Mundus has far less presence and build up like the original Mundus in DMC1. Mundus is overall a big step down from previous villains like Arkham, Virgil, but he's still better than that guy from DMC2. King? Yeah. Here's your crown. Ah, uh, so what's the takeaway from all this then? Well, DMC Remake is in fact a good game. Crazy, I know. It has some very good gameplay, which has plenty of replay value due to the upgrades and difficulties, as well as somewhat decent DLC, allowing you to play as Virgil. Even if it is Soy Virgil, you gotta love any Virgil's moveset in a DMC game. That's just a fact. Combine this with beautiful map design, as well as an enjoyable soundtrack, if you're into that kind of thing. I am, because I'm insane. Overall, brilliant to play. However, the narrative and dialogue range from good to goodness gracious, this is bad. If you decide to give DMC a try, just uh, just take the story in your stride, okay? Just know that they tried, and there was passion there, and there are good elements to be found. It had a lot of potential for a sequel, I will say it, and I will forever be sad that Ninja Fury will never have a chance to redeem themselves and expand on this universe. Because it's a fun take on DMC, if a little weird at times, and I'd have enjoyed a sequel about Virgil and his demon army trying to get revenge on Dante and Cap. It does make sense why the game gets so much hate though. When you look back at the circumstances, you honestly cannot blame DMC fans for reacting so negatively. 
to this game. If anything, I miss games like these that weren't amazing, weren't bad. Something that modern gaming is missing due to how much it costs to make games next gen now. This era of 360 and PS3 games that were somewhat decent are truly treasures and I believe that there is nothing wrong with enjoying something that's only okay every now and then. Not everything has to blow your socks off, you know? But I mean, uh, if you want the J-Man's secret sauce, the true way to play this game, let me enlighten you. Use the Mexico mod.